good news. Amen. Amen. Praise, Praise the Lord. So there's a guy, he's driving down the highway. It's late night, almost early morning hours. Everybody's in bed but him, it seems. Nobody else is on the road. Stormy, rainy night. Boom, he has a blowout. Frustrated, he gets out of his car, goes to the trunk, lifts it up, pulls out the spare, but there's no lug wrench to be found. Looks down the road, there's a little farmhouse down there and he sees a light out there in front of the house and so he, he sets foot through the driving rain and the mind starts turning as it always does in these situations. I need to reach that farmer, certainly he'll have a, 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 you know, a lug wrench, I can change my tire. He's probably in bed, it's late. Probably nice and warm and snug. He might not even answer the door. You know how the process goes like that. And even if he did, he'd probably be angry that I woke him up in the middle of the night. He might have a shotgun. Anyway, he keeps making his way blindly through the dark, getting closer. Shoes and socks and coat and clothing's all soaked. Oh, man, if he does answer the door, he's going to be mad. He's probably going to shout like something like, What's the big idea? Waking me up at this hour of the night. Thoughts keep turning. The more he thought about the anger he got. After all, I mean, you know, uh, I'm stranded out here in the middle of nowhere. What right does that farmer have to turn me down? I'd give him a lug wrench if he needed one. I'm stranded here in the middle of nowhere. I'm soaked to the skin. It's cold out here. I'm in trouble. That selfish farmer. No doubt about that. Finally reaches the house. Knocks loudly on the door. Light goes on upstairs. He said, who's out there? You know darn well who it is. <laughs> He's angry. It's me. You can keep your blasted lug wrench. I wouldn't bar it from now if you were the last man on earth. <laughs> Don't laugh too much because our minds have an ability to do that to ourselves. Once they start down dark paths, they many times continue that journey. That's why so many of us live in such doubts in our life and have so many fears in our life and so much confusion in our life. These are uncertain times. We can imagine scenarios. We walk through the malls. Yeah, we should always be on guard and, you know, present at mind of what's going on around us. But too many people, they just take it and let it go. Those kind of things, you know, minister to them and teach them and instruct them. And they listen to those kind of instructions, which are pessimistic and defeating and, you know, and negative. And it's always what the worst could be. And, you know, uh, it, it's that word of fear that comes in. The Greek word for fear in the New Testament is the word phobia. We're familiar with that word. It's phobeo in the Greek. It literally just means to be afraid. And that's where a lot of people are, especially in the day and age that we are living in. There's a lot of people, because of the uncertainty of times, because of the economy, because of the situation, because of the oil industry and all the things that surround us in our little world here, you know, we, people begin to think, what? Oh, the worst that could happen. They start to think about the worst that could happen. You know, but the message of Christmas, we come into this holiday season, it's, it's the very message that thwarts all that negativity and it thwarts all that fear. In fact, the title of the message today is the, is the Fear Knots of Christmas, that there are certain verses that tell the Christmas story. And there's about four verses uniquely that tell us that we should not fear in the times we're living in. We start thinking and our minds start turning in, in our fears and our doubts and our worries. We start thinking about the worst that could happen yeah, unfortunately, I think the Bible kind of gives, lends itself to teach us if that's the way we go, then that's the way we'll end up. It was Job who said, you know, my, my, the, the things that I feared the most have come upon me. And I think that fear is almost if we choose to follow that route in our life, it becomes the open invitation for the worst of the worst of the worst. And many times we bring those things upon ourselves, I believe, because that's the path we trod and that's the pay, play, pace we set. One writer put this, he said, fear... It's the wrong use of our imagination. It's anticipating the worst, not the best that can happen. Now, you have to realize that the Bible makes it very clear that there's a spirit, a literal spirit that feeds that, a spirit of fear. The Bible also makes it clear to believers that God hadn't given us the spirit of fear, but he's given us the spirit of a sound mind. I mean, we have the capacity to think right. And the process of thinking right is not letting our minds be filled with fears and with doubts and all these other outcomes that we think could happen in our life. If we follow that course, we may end up well in the middle of that course. 
But the message of Christmas, we see these announcements being given to Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and Zechariah, and they all kind of begin with the same thing, you know, fear not, fear not. In fact, there's four in the New Testament. First is the fear not of salvation. The angel said unto the shepherds, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings which shall be to all people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Don't be afraid. Hey, I want you to know that's where a lot of people are stuck right there. They're afraid of the Savior. They're afraid if they get their life right with God, they surrender their heart to Jesus, the worst of the worst of the worst is going to happen. I, I, I went through that. I don't know about you and your dealings with conviction and the Holy Spirit working in my life. It was like, I don't know, I, you know, I, if, if I give my life to the Lord, you know, he's just going to ruin my life. You know, he's really going to mess my life up. I'm, you know, I, I'm not going to have any fun. I'm going to lose my friends. I mean, there's disaster and death and pain and loss. That's not the message of the gospel. In fact, the message of Jesus himself was, I have come that you might have life and that life more abundantly. I mean, that's the message of, of Christmas. They said, you know, there's a savior. You don't be afraid of a savior. There's that, there's that fear, but there's also the fear of rejection. Maybe that's what some of you may have felt at one time, or maybe even today. If I really get things right with God, there's people who are gonna, they're gonna think things about me that I really don't, I, you know, I might not be accepted. I might not be, you know, socially popular. So, you know, I, I'm afraid that men, men might reject me if I choose to live wholeheartedly for Christ. That's a fear that's addressed in scripture. Fear not, a savior a deliverer, a rescuer, a salvation's available, that you can be born again, you can have life. And true acceptance is not from the world, true acceptance is from God. William Grinnell put it this way, he said, we fear men so much because we fear God so little. In fact, the bottom line with fear, it gets down at the whole concept from the Old Testament, the New Testament, uh, you know, I've always heard this definition, the fear of the Lord is all, a reverential awe. Have you, you heard that right? But it's so, it, you know, that's something that people can't even wrap their heads around. What's reverential awe? Reverential awe. <laughs> I don't know. I can't even express it. Let me give you a, a little more contemporary term that might help you understand it a little bit more. The fear of the Lord is respect for God. The highest respect for God. I respect God's word more than yours. I respect God's opinion more than yours. I respect God's commands more than yours. I respect what God says more than what my imaginations say. I respect what his word says over what my emotions might dictate. I respect him. That's the idea, the context, the concept behind it is a, is a holy respect for God that you do really believe that he is God. He's above all things. If I respect God more than I respect myself, I'll honor God. After that honor and that worship and that submission, all born out of, a, an, a, 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 I believe, a, a supernatural revelation that we realize that God is God and there is no other. That all the honor goes to him, all the submission, all the respect, all the glory goes to him. So why should we be afraid of rejection of what men would say? We ought to be more concerned with what God might think. What will my friends say? <laughs> listen, if, I, I better listen to what God might say. What would the world say? And I, my opinion should rest upon what does the Lord say? Fear not. I don't have to be afraid of what they say, in other words. I don't have to be afraid of what my, what my, what, what my mind and my personal mental battle. I'm, I, God's word is right and God's word is true. I put my faith there. I put my trust there. I don't even have any fears in my life. Christians are the same way. We commit our life to Christ. We start going on with the Lord. We start maturing in Christ. And then something happens, uh, some event, some sin, some stronghold. And, and we get to that point where we respect that more than we respect God. Do I respect that? Do I give heed to that? Do I pay attention to that? Or would I rather respect God? That fear not. There's another fear not in the scriptures found when God, the, Holy, the angel speaks to Mary and says, fear not, Mary, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest will overshadow thee. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. It's a pretty powerful word, amen? The fear not of the humanly impossible. But how often does that particular fear the mountains we do not think are surpassable or climbable. The breadths of the ocean in our own life and our own experiences we don't think are passable. 
We just get to that point where we look at those things and our focus is upon those things and we freeze up in our hearts surrendering to Christ and we just forget to realize we do not look at things with our physical eyes for with God, nothing is impossible. Uh, how many times you've, you've, you've dealt with people, maybe even witnessing to them for as an unbeliever to come to know Christ or even a believer, you know, that's facing some fears and you, you talk to them. It's kind of like, well, what if it doesn't work out? You ever felt that way? What if this doesn't work out? Excuse me. What do you mean by that? You mean it, what if it doesn't work out the way I want it to <laughs> or the way God wants it to? You know, we're not concerned about what God wants. We're not concerned about what we want, right? What if it didn't work out the way I want it to work out? The Bible makes it very clear that our minds are so limited and so small and so puny and so finite compared to the infinite God. We don't get it. We don't see the big picture. We don't see the long haul. We don't see the end of the road. He does. He knows clearly. I don't have to be afraid of, well, what if it's not? And what if it doesn't? God is in the life changing business. God is in a supernatural work of working in our hearts. For me, it, coming to Christ, I felt with that with one way. What if it doesn't work for me? What if I can't do what the Bible says? Well, let me tell you right off the bat, you can't anyway, but he can. And if you'll step aside and let him, he will. Bible says if any man is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. The key is getting in Christ. The key is surrendering your heart. The key is in surrendering your will. Then God begins to work in your heart and life. You let him be on board. You let him be in charge. In other words, you get back to that place where you give him the honor. You respect his opinion over and above of what your opinion is. You respect, you respect his plan over and above what your plan is. I mean, just, what if it doesn't work out? Hey, with God, all things work out. In fact, not only do they work out, all things work together for good. In other words, you may be going through some horror experiences, but ultimately, it'll all work for good. Well, I don't know if I believe that. Well, then you can live in despair or you can live in faith because in faith, there is a sure and a steady confidence of hope that we believe God. And no matter what may, may befall us, God is full of mercy and God is full of grace. You know, as a child of God, we, when we're asked to do things, we look at and we think like, you know, with, with Mary's situation, she's thinking, this is not possibility. This doesn't happen. You're, you're talking about God's going to overshadow me and I'm going to have, I'm going to experience a pregnancy. And, you know, I don't get that. I, that doesn't work. And that's, that's, you know, that doesn't work according to medicine, nor science, nor logic, nor the physical realm. None of those things dictate that as a possibility. Don't sweat it. Don't fear. I know it looks impossible with everything that the world dictates. But Mary, for God, nothing's impossible. Those are powerful words. But they have to be embraced. You know? We get back as children of God and we think, well, I just don't think I can accomplish her. I don't think, I mean, she's the perfect illustration, right? Of, 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 of we do not fear in the face of these things because we believe God. Too many people live like the two guys going through the jungle, you know. You've heard about two guys, they come across the, the bear or the lion, you know, the old story about, you know, they start lacing up their shoes, and one of them says, you know, I'm not worried about the bear or the lion, I just need to outrun you, that story. You know, the other one goes like this, you know, they come across a line and they freeze in their steps, and one guy says, keep calm, keep calm, don't, don't move, don't move, don't, just don't say anything. What are you talking about? He said, remember we read the book on survival. And the book on survival says when you come across a wild beast in, in, in the jungle, you just stand perfectly still and you look this line directly in the eye and he'll turn away and he'll run. His companion says, sure. I read the book. You read the book. But has the line read the book? <laughs> we get to where our mind goes, you know. Hey, there's another book we can read and we can have absolute confidence in that book. We can have absolute surety that, hey, there's nothing that you cannot do. There's nothing that cannot be done if God is leading in this situation. If God's hand is on this situation, you trust him and you believe him. Even if things look humanly impossible, God is still on the throne. And the one who put all these principles that we rely on in order, and we make our business and judgment based on the natural order of things, all right? I don't jump off a building because I know I'll break my neck, those kind of things. There are laws and principles. God's the one who made those laws and wrote those rules and they put those things in order. He's the same one that can overrule any one of them at any time, so should he desire. That's why he could walk on water. 
That's why his touch could heal the sick. That's why he could speak and demons would flee. Because everything moves at his command. So we can trust him. He's not limited like we are. The third fear, Nada, is an interesting fear, Nada. I felt this particular fear. I call it, you know, the, the fear, not of, of, an, of an unanswered prayers. This is Zechariah, remember? They've been praying for a son, and no son has come, and now they're well into their years. But the angel of the Lord says to Zechariah, Your prayer is heard, so don't be afraid. Your prayer's been heard. Elizabeth shall bear a son, and you're going to call his name Jesus. And this is not possible anymore. It was. 15 years ago. It was 20 years. No, it can't happen now. This, that doesn't happen. Don't be afraid. It's going to happen the way I said it's going to happen. Why? Because I'm God. And this message is true. How often, though, we, we felt that way. We've been praying and we've been asking God for something. We don't see the results. And we enter into this realm of fear and we enter into this realm of unbelief. And we think, for whatever reason, certainly God must be mad at us or God's not hearing us or God doesn't understand our predicament. Or maybe he's not taking a second look. You know, we just, all this fear, all this doubt, all this unbelief enters our hearts. Uh, you need to understand. I mean, we spent a lot of time over the last couple of months talking about prayer. But please get back to the simplicity of this. You need to understand that when you pray, God listens. If your heart is right, God, even when your heart is wrong, God still hears your prayers. And he answers them accordingly to what is best for you and what is best for the plan of the universe and the cosmos that is in place, that, is, that lines up perfectly with his will. And his will is for you. That's why the Bible says over and over again, for you, for God so loved you. Hebrews is filled with for you, for you, for you. He provided a high priest. He provided a sacrifice. He provided an intercessor. He provided an advocate for you, for you, for you. Do you think he did all that and then would not commit himself to you? Paul tried to make the principle clear in Romans when he wrote the church. He said, listen, if he has done all these things, if he sacrificed his own son for you, don't you think he'll carry you the rest of the way? That's the Joe Arms translation. Don't you think he'll provide everything else needed in life for you? This is hard to come to. You know, it's easy to say this from a pulpit, and it's easy to speak it even in Sunday school lessons and lift group studies, isn't it? But as other things happen in our life and other uncertainties that arise in our life, that's when trust comes in. That's when obedience comes in. That's when faith comes in. And you know that my wife is going through some difficulties with her heart. We've been in and out of the hospital again, and doctors are, you know, giving us reports, and everything looks negative of heart failure and conditions within her heart valves that need to be replaced and open heart surgery and possibilities, all those things that just looks like dark clouds and doom. Uh, they sent her immediately over from their office to the emergency room. We tried to work on some of the symptomatic things that were going on at the same time running tests. You know, you get all this and they've got, are you not hearing my prayers? Are you not paying attention? You know, we leave the hospital, they come in, they fit her what's called a, a life vest, which is basically a defibrillator that monitors her heart condition, will shock her if it's needed. You know, if the, that she has a, an emergency backup that's going on. And, and you walk away, and I want you to know it's very clear, and you know this because each of you on some level have gone through this in your own life on some different scenario in some different way. And if you haven't, you will. So you need to be very clear with this. Those are the times that Satan clouds your mind more than any other time. And those are the times when the doubts come like at no other times. Those are when the fiery darts are being fired at you to destroy your faith. And to add to that, you get physically tired. You get emotionally worn out. You get drained. And he just keeps, he doesn't let up because you're tired. All right. You can't go in a corner room and cry and hope he quits and has sympathy for you. He kicks you while you're down. And so, you know, there's this, there's this intense war that rages and you feel probably like this, you know, God, you don't hear my prayer. You're not listening to my situation. You know, I, and this is where a lot of people, they quit. They throw their hands up. God doesn't love me. They walk away in the midst of the crisis. They, they bail out on God. And if they don't do it in front of everybody, they do it in their heart. They quit being faithful. They quit being committed. They quit sharing their faith. They quit studying the word. You know, they just decline. When those are the times it ought not to press us from God, those are the times it should press us unto God. God answers my prayer. God answers your prayer. God hears my prayer. Sometimes he answers immediately and sometimes it's later, but I want you to know God is there. Sometimes it's not the answer I want, but it's an answer. And it's always the right answer. 
What the Apostle Paul said, I am persuaded that God is able to keep that which I've committed unto him uh, against that day. You know, I believe God's able to carry me all the way to heaven. God's able to carry me all the way through this and he's not going to abandon me and I don't have to be afraid in the midst of this storm. I can trust the Lord. I, tell you, there's, there's, I have a very precious friend, kind of a, a great brother and, and mentor in the faith and by the name of Billy Crosby. Some of you may have met Billy Crosby. He used to be the pastor of Houston Northwest. I think it's first Houston now, something like that of Northwest Houston. It's the one on 249 over there around Cypresswood, the church that's over there. He passed that church for many years. And he's 79 now and a uh, precious saint in the Lord. His wife's 79. She's battling with dementia. And, you know, he's, he said, my ministry has changed, Brother Joe, from, from many to one. But he said, I want to share a scripture with you. And he, shared, he sent me this, this passage in Isaiah, the whole chapter. I know it's hard for you to read a whole chapter. But I'm going to read the whole chapter to you. So hold on. It's all of six verses. All right. And it's, it's a time when... Israel's been going through great trouble. Part of it's their own fault. But even if it wasn't, God's taken them through this to deepen them. And he says this, he says in chapter 12 of Isaiah, he says, then you will say on that day, that day of deliverance, I will give thanks to you, Lord, for although you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song. And it's become my salvation. Man, what a great word. Therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. And in that day, you will say, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. And make them remember that his name is exalted. Praise the Lord in song. He's done excellent things. Let this be known throughout the earth and cry aloud and shout for joy. For great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Man, what a ministry those passages would have been in the last few days. Just powerful presence. God comes in and he says, hey, I got this. I got this. In whatever valley you may be going through, and I know some of you are going through some very difficult times. He's there in the midst of them. Don't be afraid to cry out unto the Lord. He hears your prayers. He answers them. We just need to be patient and not run. The last fear not is the fear not of what we'll call obedience, but more important, immediate obedience. You know, we're familiar with the story of, of Christmas and Joseph and the narrative that takes place and Mary. Can you imagine that conversation between Mary and Joseph? I'm pregnant. What? And, you know, let's, let's be real. And God intervenes to Joseph and through an angel, he speaks to him. Joseph, son of David. In other words, you're my child. Listen to me. Don't be afraid to take Mary to you for your wife. You follow the story and says, Then Joseph did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him. What, what's those last words? Then Joseph did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him. What did Joseph do? He did what God said. And so often we're afraid because of circumstance or situation just to continue to obey the Lord. We stop or we'll delay obedience. But understand, well, Thomas, Thomas A. Kempis put it this way. Instant obedience is the only kind of obedience that there is. Let me say that again. Instant obedience is the only kind of obedience that there is. Delayed obedience is disobedience. And whoever strives to withdraw from obedience, he went on to say, Whoever strives to withdraw from obedience withdraws from grace. The last thing we need to do in our life is withdraw from grace. Grace is where we meet God. Grace is where we find power. Grace is where God gives us strength. Grace is where God enables us. Grace is where we find the strength, the passion, the power to do what we normally could not do. The grace of God moves in or intervenes. But we delay. Another way, what we would call, we, we, we obey, but it's not real obedience. It's kind of a partial thing. You know, we kind of go through the motions. Because perhaps we're afraid to obey. I mean, this is a big task. This is Joseph's life. It's his future. What are people going to say? What's the culture going to do? What are friends and family going to say? If I obey God, what are the ramifications here? Joseph did what the Lord had bidden him. Many times we're just afraid to obey. 
Someone wrote this, it's a great deal easier to do that which God gives us to do, no matter how hard it is, than to face the responsibilities of not doing it. What does that mean? It's a whole lot easier, no matter how hard it may appear to be, to do what God has told you to do. Why? Because you have grace. <coughs> than to disobey the Lord and face the responsibilities of not doing what God's told you to do. Imagine, if you will, that you work for a company and whose president comes to you and says, you know, guys, there's some things that have come up internationally that I'm going to have to attend to. I'm going to be out of the country for an extended time. He gathers all his trusted employees around him for a big conference and meetings and says, listen, I'm going to leave. I want you to pay. I trust you. You are my, the best of this corporation. I trust you to pay close attention to the business. I'll be sending by letter, by email, by communications, instructions to, over, to oversee and to manage things while I'm away. I'll write you and I need you to do from now until I return what I request you to do in the communications that I send to you. Everybody assures him and agrees. He leaves and he's gone for a couple of years. When he returns, of course, while he's gone, he's continuing to communicate with him, as he said, with the emails, the letters, all those come with specific and concise instructions of what they need to be taking and doing to take care of the, of the business at hand. But when he returns, he walks up to the office and he notices that the flower beds have not been kept. There's weeds growing. Windows are cracked on the front of the building. It's dirty. He walks into the main re uh, reception area. It's dirty. It hadn't been cleaned for a while. The receptionist is snoozing at the desk with her headphones on. He walks in past her. The offices are empty and unoccupied. People are just kind of chit-chatting in the hallways and around the water coolers. You know, things are, uh, things are a mess. Loud music's roaring from some of the offices in the back. Two or three people are engaged in horseplay and some other part of the building. And instead of doing what he's written to them, instead of making a profit, his business has suffered tremendous loss. Of course, without hesitation, he's time for a conference. Everyone comes together. And with this tremendous frown on his face, he asks, what happened? Did you not get my communications? Did you not get the letters I sent to you? And they begin to respond one after the other. Well, sir, yes, sir, we got them. We read them all. We got them. In fact, some of us even took your letters to keep a copy and we bound them in a manual, put them in a book. In fact, some of us, another one says, some of us have even memorized sections of those letters and those instructions. Another guy sheepishly raised his hand. Yes, sir. And some of us meet on Sundays and we study those letters. We spent a lot of time talking about them, asking questions about them. We prepared some guides to go along with your letters. Yes, sir, you in the back? Those were really good letters. They were really great. I mean, you write a good letter. I think the president would then ask, but what'd you do about my instructions? What'd you do about the things I told you to do? And no doubt one employee would raise his hand and say, do? Well, well, nothing, but we read them all. That is such a picture of the modern day church. Paralyzed by their fears, paralyzed by their doubts, paralyzed by their disobedience. The message of salvation and the message of Christmas is such a message of glad tidings, good news. Life altering, Savior's born, don't be afraid. We can do the impossible. We can live a different kind of life. We don't have to be afraid of what the world says, being rejected by what people think. Do indeed what the Lord said. But on the other hand, I think what's happened here in this simple illustration is what's happened all too often in the church. Because of our fears, we've been paralyzed. I think we need to get back to not just knowing the meaning of Christmas, studying the meaning of Christmas, reading the gospel accounts of the Christmas story, memorizing sections of the Christmas story, writing musicals about the Christmas stories, preparing songs and poems and books about the Christmas stories. We need to go back to living the Christmas story. 
And I pray that this Christmas will be the most transformative Christmas you've ever experienced in your life. Don't be afraid. Move forward. Don't be afraid to obey. Move forward. But don't delay. Do as Joseph. And he did exactly what the Lord said. Let's be that kind of person. Would you stand with your heads bowed? I would like to give an invitation today.